I can feel my saturation leaving me slowly. What a way, to, what a beautiful and, and optimistic way to start a brand new album for 21 Pilots, a wonderfully transparent, creative duo featuring, of course, Tyler Joseph, one of my favorite people to talk to on the planet when it comes to music, art, craft, and all that goes into it. What's up, man? Good to see you. Thanks for having me, man. Thanks for coming back with, you know, such a wonderful creative record, 11 songs, so tight. It's just like choo -choo, everything you need to say right there in between these two pillars. I could tell because you're a, a very aesthetically driven human being that that was all very deliberate. Everything is very deliberate. Why 11 songs? Why the time frame? How did it work out? I would say for this record, uh, you know, usually when you're writing records, you have an idea of which song you're writing. Like this is a number three song or this is towards the back end, like to bring it home, or this is the last song. Uh, on this one, I, I knew that the song Good Day was going to be the first song on the record, and I knew the song Redecorate was going to be the last one. But everything inside there was very, it was more liquid and available to be moved around as the creation process happened. And so, um, and it's supposed to feel like that. It's supposed to feel like a, you know, a flow of creativity rather than something very chronological which I, in the past, I've done some more chronological stuff, so. And yet it feels very compact. And, and like I said, as focused as any other record you've ever, ever made. I suppose for the first time, you were able to surprise yourself with that by going into that selection process and that ordering process with the same sense of kind of wonder as we get when we hear it for the first time because you haven't been putting all those things in place as you've been going along. You must have surprised yourself with this album a bit. On the last record on Trench, I got caught up in the idea of trying to reinvent a wheel when it comes to song structure and different approaches in the songwriting style and the, the lyrics and um, how abstract I could get. And, um, and I enjoyed stretching myself in that way. On this record, I really wanted to bring it back to the craft of songwriting, to stay within the parameters. I, I view it as a a picture frame you know what, how, what can i what can i put in the into that picture frame what can what kind of painting can i do it's it's a short record it's like a little over 30 some minutes long you know and it, for you know to put a year of your life into something and then you have 30 minutes to show for it is, is a pretty um humbling <laughs> experience quality <laughs> not quantity tyler you know that how did you know this was going to be the first song then how did you what what made it so it was so different than every other first song that i've ever done I've kind of developed this formula for how live shows should feel. And I think that because the live experience is so tied to the creation process of the record, <clears throat> I've always naturally written a first song that felt like would also be the first song for a live experience. And, you know, it's got the low rumble. It's got the, you know, the ominous, you know, we're about to take over your life type of thing. And this was um, a completely different first. This is like a... I wanted it to feel like I was turning lights on. I was like, I was, I walked into a warehouse and I, you know, it was everything, you know, it was kicking on section by section. And that's what this song felt like. And then all of a sudden to go into this piano riff, it, it just was reminiscent of how maybe some older concerts would have started rather than what, what we do today with the big scrim that falls down and the, the low rumble and the big boom. Like it's, it's a little more walk out on stage, turn the lights on and smile was kind of the the vibe for this first song. And so is that the saturation that you refer to to some degree in the opening line, which is always a very important moment on any album. The idea of oversaturating yourself with your own with your own creativity or your own like you say parameters or desire to reinvent the wheel. Well, I knew that this record was going to be very colorful, and so the idea of saturation was one that I was going to compensate for in the branding. I was going to make it very colorful. We're going to have just a flow of different colors coming in and the branding was going to be very bright and exciting. And then lyrically talking about desaturation, this song is, a, is about getting to a place where if I were to lose everything, if I lost my wife and my kid, how would I in the first week react to that? And I think that what I would be is overly positive, like it's fine, there's a reason for everything, I'm okay. I even like put a specific time on it. Like I feel like a lot of stuff, anytime you go on vacation, something weird might happen. Like someone comes down with some um, weird sickness. I've had a couple of weird things happen to my family while on vacation. 
I don't know if that's just me or if other people have experienced that. Maybe you're in a new place, you don't have your rhythm normal and something happens. But the idea of, I was trying to put myself there, like how would I react to some terrible thing happening over you know, a vacation that we were all on? And it was a really dark place to go. And the fact that this song is, that's what it's talking about, is trying wow. to wrestle with, you know, in the lyric to the chorus is talking about how, um, would you say you depend on the weather because my sunshine is a buzz and a light. I'll be singing out. I know it's hard to believe me, but it's a good day. But, you know, I really do feel like the the vice of drinking and smoking, like I would just be like, no lid, let's go, go all in. I would just search for anything I could to compensate for that sorrow. I don't know. It's a, it's a really um, powerful thing to try to write about something, you know, almost projecting something that hopefully never happens. As a fellow husband and father, that is the worst thing I can imagine. That is my number one fear worst. Number is, one, yeah. is, is losing my family. That'll send me into a spiral. And so I know you're a courageous writer. It's one of the things I love about your music is that you go there. But that is like a whole other level for you to go and, and, and approach that and then to dress it up in these colorful clothes. I feel like this song, Good Day, not only is it a great song to start a record, but it's also, I would imagine that there is a spectrum of grief. I, people talk about the stages of grief. And I would imagine that one of those stages would feel a little bit like this song, where you're just convincing yourself. You're, I mean, you're talking to someone Absolute purely denial. in denial. Absolute denial. Yeah. I wanted to try to put a timestamp on what that period of, of grief might feel like. You've spent the last year plus, like the rest of us, in your situation, and everyone's micro is whatever the situation they found themselves in on day one of quarantine, that's kind of it. And depending on where you are on the spectrum of wealth and health and all those things that suddenly come into focus will depend on how much you can change your, your and, and alter your scenario, right? Be spontaneous, be malleable in an otherwise very unmalleable scenario. You found yourself at home a father and a father-to-be and a husband and all of that stuff going on at the same time that you were starting to collect your creative thoughts. What was that process like for you looking back on it now, now that we can? It was crazy. I have this argument with my father about, he says, the best workers are dads. You know, there's something about when you become a dad, you become a harder worker, you become a, a better worker. The best the workers hunter gatherer are mentality is what they refer to it as, right? I guess. And actually, I've always argued with them. Like, well, I mean, you can't argue, dad, that it, when you become a dad, you have less time to work on that thing that you're working on. So you think that you become a better worker. And this, of, of course, this is like pre me being a father. I would always argue, inevitably, dad, when you have a kid, time gets taken away from what you're able to pour into your craft. There's no way that you are a better worker from becoming a father. And so I, I kind of stood, I mean, not that I didn't want to be a dad, but for him to be so blatant and so steadfast in believing that when you become a dad, when you become a parent, you become a better worker. I just didn't understand how you could balance the time it takes to be a parent. Uh, and it's going to be extracted from the time that you would pour into that craft. Then something hit me during this making of the record, how to justify the philosophy that you become a better worker when you become a dad. I realize that uh, if I were to go into a parallel universe and we were to split off and the musician, you know, artist, songwriter Tyler would continue down this path where he wasn't a family guy and he just kept on, you know, creating every single day. And then, or the path that I'm on right now, which is I'm splitting my time between what it is I do for a living, working on songs, but also being, you know, a part of a family. I realized that what would happen is, yes, right in the front end of that timeline on the, you know, single guy, he would probably chug away and get a lot done. But I know that inevitably I would burn out. I would hit a wall where I just don't, what's the point? If I don't have, I don't, if I'm not able to answer the question, what is the point of me working on these songs? What are the, what's the point of me creating? And I don't have anything to point back to that is the point. I would just, I would burn out. I know. And so this other parallel, the universe I'm living right now, where I may not be able to chug and, and grind as hard as I want because I have to split my time up, 
I believe that there's actually a longevity to that career because I'm able to stop. And anytime I'm a slightly burnt out, I turn around and I know why I'm doing what I'm doing. So in a sense, my dad was right all the time. And, uh, and he always tends to be. So I figured that out this year. I figured that out that my dad's smart. Did you feel prepared to become a father? Was it something that when you became a dad, that those instincts came naturally to you? Or did you have to spend some time working on yourself in order to identify what, how you could play the best possible role in your, in your children's future? You know, I'm a, I'm a father of one. She's you know, a little over one years old. And one of the first things you have to do as a parent before you're even, you even become a parent is you have to name that kid and talk about the beginning of heavy decisions. <laughs> you know, like that's just the cusp of decisions you have to make as a parent. That's, that's number one. And so when someone is thinking about becoming a parent, becoming a mom or a dad um, or a guardian or, or whatever, and, and you start to feel like, oh my gosh, there's all these decisions that need to be made and I don't know how I would ever be able to rise to that occasion. Something happens when it happens. And what I mean by that is, you know, I, I knew I wanted to name my daughter Rosie, but I was up until she was born, I was, I was just so like, is that the right name? Is she gonna like that name? Is she gonna become that name? Is the name gonna become her? You know, how is it gonna impact her, her decisions? You know, people have this, philosophy that your name can actually change the course of, you know, your, your future. Um, and, you know, just that being the number one decision out of a infinite amount of decisions I have to make as a father, I was so worked up about, did I name her right? And then she was born and something clicked where it was like, oh, that's Rosie. Yeah. That, that's her. It, it just, that was an, that, you know, looking back, I remember that it was a tough decision, but now that the name is connected to the face, it's like they, it, there was no other, there was no other option. And a lot of the decisions that I make as a parent that my wife and I make, we realize leading up to decision moment is the most stressful moment. But when the decision is made and you make a certain um, turn with them, you realize, oh, that's just who they are. That's who it always was going to be. And it really starts to take the pressure out of becoming a parent and so yeah leading up to being a parent it is the it is the most constricting stressful thing but when it happens something clicks i hear you when you talk about leading up to the decision and in that sense of kind of com completion and ultimate relief once the decision is made okay now we get on with living with the decision you know and i sort of wonder whether or not that realization at a pivotal moment in anyone's life when they become a parent prepared you to handle the decision-making process differently as a creative because I know that you take each decision when it comes to 21 Pilots very seriously. So in going into making this record, was there a correlation between making a decision as a parent and ultimately moving forward as a creative? It's a good question. I think that one of the greatest strengths that you can have as not just a songwriter, but a, a performer and a musician is the ability to fast forward and put yourself, project yourself onto uh, something that's going to happen. The ability to just calm yourself and picture yourself there. So the question of, you know, as something as simple as, wait, that song, we shouldn't put it next to that song in the set list because I just ran around for three minutes and then you want, you know, then I shouldn't be just sitting down and calmly hitting those vocal notes because I'm going to be out of breath. You know, so instead of realizing that the hard way, you put yourself there and then you start working backwards. What are the, what are lessons that I'm going to learn having done this? And so having that being something that I'm always focusing on, you know, whether it's, be, you know, mostly because of concerts, you know, trying to project and put yourself there before you get up on stage, doing the rehearsal before you know, in your head, even um, as a parent, I've been thinking about being a parent for a long time. You know, I've, I've been thinking about how I want to tell her. I think she's pretty, even at a very young age. It's like, I know I want to tell her that all the time. To answer your question, as a, as a creative, I've always worked on trying to trying to see something happen before it happens. And that, I guess, in a sense, has helped me be a dad. You know, I took a video of her. She's starting to walk around. and um, 
she walked up to me and she said something and I'm videoing on my phone, you know, and, and then I do the first thing I, I, I've never done this before. I play the video for her. You can see her connect like that's me. And she's looking at it. She's very excited about it. But then this weird, like concern look looks, you know, is on her face. Like she doesn't understand why that's her. And maybe, and all of a sudden it hit me like one day she might not like what she looks like. And I'm going to have to help her realize that she's beautiful and she's, she's uh, amazing. And I, I want to start that now, even when she's one years old, you know? And so you start to look, you start to project things out and try to, what are some lessons I'm going to learn and how can I start preparing for them right now? And that's one that it hit me just the other day. What's well, amazing realization because you, you vicariously, you begin to actually do that work on yourself because you can't be authentic unless you ultimately recognize the value in yourself. You cannot impart that wisdom if you're not feeling great or trying to find a way to accept and acknowledge who you are. Right. And I don't think I've ever asked you this question, but at album number six, Better Late Than Never, was that a challenge for you? Even through all of the lights and the cheers, the screams and the sales and the streams and the awards and the good times, has there been a narrative through your life where you've been searching to, for a place to, for a way to, ways to accept yourself with more ease? Well, I've always been very grateful of the timing when it comes to my career. Not just, I mean, yes, with the pandemic and, you know, I've, I've been asked a few times about like, man, how, how unlucky is it that you just started getting going and you were doing shows and, uh, and I look at that and then everything gets shut down. And I look at that and go, no, how lucky are we that we got these records out, that we, we went and grind all over the world and played shows all over the world and sold out arenas. And we got all that in before this new thing that changed and stopped the entire world. I mean, I look at some of these younger artists that kind of got robbed of being able to do that. And so I look at it as very grateful. And along with, you know, the conversation of, of timing, I really do think that like 21 year old Tyler was a very different person than 23, 24 year old Tyler. And I think that for a lot of these young kids who start, you know, seeing some some success, um, it happens to them pretty early. And then you're kind of frozen there. And I'm so glad that it happened, you know, for Josh and I, when we, you know, we finally were able to get our head on our shoulders. I think the timing of when things started happening for us, um, in many ways, looking back, um, has been has been pretty incredible. Partially why I wonder, you know, like, Someone asked me, like, what, what can I do? I want to get into music. How do I start? And there's so much of just stars aligning that have to do with this thing. It's, it's hard to give them advice. How do you give that as advice? How do you give timing as a tangible piece of advice? You know, you just, you had to write Shy Away. I saw the article. You had to write Shy Away because the only way you could really show your brother to some degree about the experience is to go through the process because words don't add up to experience and everyone's experience is so unique. That's tough. That's tough when your brother wants to be a creative and wants to do and find his own voice coming to his brother and asking for that kind of advice. It's, it's that's not an easy dynamic. No, it's not. I mean, I think he's a super talented guy. My family means the world to me. And I think that, I think I've realized something that maybe some people start to learn later in their life, but really, the people who will die for you, I mean, that's that's all that really matters. You know, like, everything else is just extra. You know, everything else is kind of just noise. Did you miss your boy during the making of this record? Did you miss Josh? Because, you know, you had to do it from separate, of course, right? You guys are the bros. I mean, you know, figuring that part out. Everyone just thought the whole world of creatives would slide into this kind of virtual creative process. But just from the technical you know, restrictions of, of, of latency and trying to figure out timings and all that stuff right through to the impersonal nature of creating that way. It's amazing. Music showed up at all. How was it for you and Josh? It was, it, there are obviously pros and cons. I think on the, on the pro side, I think what we, we actually developed some rhythm and chemistry on, you know, using remote technology uh, in a way that we might, always use in, in future you know he actually he actually moved back to ohio which is pretty exciting for yeah. me so yeah. the band's back together but i think we learned a lot of really cool things about what you know what technology has to offer as far as making a record and 
you know, I could share my screen and he could see what, you know, what I was pointing at and then he could actually control my cursor and then he could, you know, record stuff. I could, I could EQ his drums as he was playing. And you know, this is all from across the country. So there's a lot of amazing things that we were able to do um, remotely, but man, it, it does take longer. <laughs> it just does. You know, it, it adds time. Every, everything, it's not, it's not a, as fluid of a conversation there's there's really i mean forget rapid fire there's no rapid fire anything uh when you're when you're trying to collaborate on a on a creative level remotely over over this it's it's really difficult but we figured it out there's a lot to talk about and specifically to do with this album it's a very deep record in a lot of ways as as exercise through song number one but there's also a lightness to it there is a certainly sonically an optimism to it that I haven't heard from yeah. you for some time, maybe, maybe never to this degree, where I feel like you're leaning into this kind of optimistic sonic palette. What inspired that? You know, because the thing that blows my mind is that you are a creative individual who goes and, 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 and plays gigs in front of thousands of people and then sort of tucks yourself away in this imaginary space in order to create. Right now, you're in your imagination, but in an isolated environment. So it's a double down. I expected this album to sound like the downward spiral. How did you figure out a different approach? Well, that's a great question. It didn't feel right to necessarily put a mirror up to my circumstances and all of our circumstances when writing this record. It didn't feel right. It didn't. It felt. It felt a little too easy uh, just to reciprocate what it is that I and many people were feeling. It felt. It felt. Um, like a little bit of a, a cop out and, and a little bit predictable as well. And, I, and so I wanted to do, well, what's the opposite of that? It's, well, turn the mirror around. And for me as a songwriter, there's a spectrum. A lot of people come in with the first initial idea with a song and they land. Usually traditionally they have a, a pattern of where they land. You know, they're just that type of songwriter. And that spectrum is really quirky mathematical interesting uh odd uh new experimental on one side right the other side is familiar you know, easy listening uh poppy exciting clean uh so those are the two ends of the spectrum and in a lot of a lot of artists and a lot of musicians and songwriters sometimes they come in over here where everything is a little distorted and what they have to do is they have to buff things out and they have to strip away a lot of the extracurricular to get closer to that center. And then they can present the, here's finally that song. It was really crazy, uh, but here, here it is, you know, because it's the, the jewel that was, you know, the pearl inside of the clam. It, it, here it is. For me, and, and you know, it's not cool to, to say this, but I've always defaulted in that cleaner lane. I, when I come in, the, the idea is very clean. It's very straightforward. It's very familiar. And so what I'm doing is the opposite of what a lot of people do. I, I like to take that simple idea and I have to work from this side towards the center and I have to, you know, make it a little, you know, tear it a little bit, you know, uh, test it, stress it uh, and, and, and rip at it and wrestle with it to get it to be the, the pure idea that I had at the very beginning, but then give it a journey to then land in the middle. And so I think with this record, because I didn't want to try too hard, what ended up happening is I didn't work as hard to 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 buff that thing back to the middle as much as maybe I, I usually do. Yeah. And I said, here's a great song. The songwriting's there. The lyrics are there. If I could just get the, the sonics to, to marry with that, with the, the energy uh, and the spirit of that song, I'm not going to work as hard. I'm just going to, I'm going to hang the painting as is sooner than maybe I would have in the past. And that's why I think the record feels a little bit lighter. I, I didn't want to work so hard to make it feel cool. You know, there's a thing that keeps coming, cropping up in my head, like a phrase, which I think is about as close to the meaning of life as you can get, uh, because it's kind of what, what our parents have to do, in particular, our mothers have to do when we're born and what we have to do when we die. And it keeps coming up every time you give me an answer, which is like letting go. And it just feels to me like that's kind of what this album signifies to some degree is, is, a, is a significant point in your journey where you're like what if i let go a little bit more what if i just let go 
yeah, that's. I think this record, there's a part of that happening for sure. I also think that, so so in a live show, I know I've got this many breaths and I've got this many words. And so if if there's a moment in between grabbing the microphone and walking to that other point of the stage, let me get as many breaths in as I can before I get there because I got I to gotta sing my, my head off. You, I look at the entire show and I go, okay, this is how much energy I have, let me time this perfectly so that I land at zero right at the end. A lot of times when I, I believe the way that I deal with, whether it's guilt or um, grief, I and mean, we talked about that a few times, there's a few moments on this record that I address grief. Uh, the way that I would deal with grief is I'm the type, when I, my grandfather died and my dad actually had a scare in the hospital not too long ago, I planned it out, go, okay, this is how many days I got left on this earth. I'm going to deal with this grief this much every day. I'm going to spread it out all the way so that I can experience the least amount of grief that I can each day. I mean, what that is, is it's not letting it go. You're talking about letting something go. And my default is to, you know, manage that feeling and spread it out as far as possible so that I don't have to hit it hard wow. all one day, let it tear me down and then get over it and then move on. And so I think that in a lot of ways, creatively, what happened, and I'm not trying to correlate, you know, losing a loved one to, you know, um, having a hit record, but what happened with Blurry Face, that record, the, the just, you know, um, meteoric rise and how quickly that all happened, I'm still wrapping my mind around that roller coaster ride. I mean, I, you would think that I would I'd be able to look back on it and it is what it is. It's still affecting the decisions I make now because dealing with that type of pressure I've decided to span it out. And that's why when it was happening, I was cool. Nothing, it never bothered me. It's like, this is the way it's supposed to be. Don't get emotional. I was born for this, right? But that was, that was my version of dealing with a tiny increment of how crazy it is that that happened to me. And so I think with Entrench, I look at the record directly following Blurry Face after that rise. What I did was I tried to lump in a little bit more of dealing with that and compensating for that rise than I should have. I was trying to say, this is not a blurry face record. This is different. This is something I'm, I'm capable of doing something else. And I was compensating for the experience that I had, in a sense. I got that out of my system. And now I think that I, on this record, Scaled and Icy, I feel like I've, I, I'm not trying to compensate for that anymore, but I am compensating for Trench because I went. it's a constant course correction. So that's why this record feels a little brighter, feels a little cleaner. It's, yeah. it's, the songwriting is, is a little more, you know, maybe it's a little more traditional. Um, and, and so I, I don't know what's next, but I, I would imagine that it's compensating for what I'm doing now. And I think that I'm always going to be zigzagging like that. And here we are. A lot of us under the assumption that the optimism is propaganda. And that, in fact, if we want to lean into the world, the 21 pilots as a creative unit occupy, which you cultivate with real care and dedication, that this album is a reaction to Trench because Trench cut too close to the bone of what's really going on. And so, therefore, the good people at DEMA have decided if you really want to see this through and you want us to keep your family safe, you better give us something chirpy here. And that's the zigzag. That's the compensation because the truth did not set you free in the end. It actually made it harder for you. Yeah. Do you want to write our little, uh, a little, a little bio for us? No, I, I, I have too much fun playing along with everybody else. And if we step back into, the, into this world for a second, you, to me, as a fan, lean into your imagination in order to better comprehend. And it allows you to experience the things that maybe you are not quite ready to experience as Tyler. 
truth. Yeah. You're you're making it. You're making me realize that this is a this is a therapy session. No, you're right. I think that there's a a version of I guess what I was talking about with, you know, dealing with any monumental moment in your life. My my default is to try to experience it and corral it in a way where I'm in control, not where the outside force is forcing me to react to whatever it wants to do to me. And one of the ways I feel like I'm in control is when I'm, I'm writing the story, I'm creating the world, I'm, I'm making these characters, uh, and then I can control that world. Uh, and I guess that maybe that's just a compensation for, you know, living in a world and not that the world, the world in which out of control. Uh, you know, I'm living in is it's not any more out of control for anyone else. For all of us, so, yeah. But but that's how I deal with the world that you all know. That's that's my that's my way of doing it. What blows my mind is when I I talk to you at Christmas time and you're like, yeah, man, Christmas tune. My engineer was like, what you got for me? And I was like, an anthem. And I was like, oh, it's highlight. I love it. I love it. This is our little Christmas present. Look at you coming in all light of touch. And I completely missed the size propaganda. I completely missed what you were doing and how you were building us up to this. Like you knew already. And I guess without an obvious question, I'm searching for some more of a, uh, an idea of, of what it's like to exist in a point where you, you, you're looking around the corner so far, you're almost staring at the back of your own neck. I love that though. That's fun for me. That's a lot of fun for me. It all comes from having a fan base that they care, you know, that's something I realize is it's so special. I don't think that that's the thing that I've come to grips with sooner than any other monumental thing that's happened in my life. I think that I'm starting to realize quicker than anything else, just how rare it is to have a fan base that, that really care for me and care for the, the stuff that Josh and I create. And, uh, but not only that, they don't, they don't need us to hang around. They make it theirs. And, um, I think that if I were to ever be like a, you know, like a, you know, working in the music industry in a, in a, in a different capacity, I feel like I wouldn't bring anything to the table because I just got spoiled. I'm not going to be able to, you know, tell some band to do this or do that because our fans, there's, there's no one, no one in the world like them. And I know that a lot of artists talk about their fans, you know, very in, endearingly, but I care about them a lot. And I'm, I'm really proud of, you know, what they've done for me. So Tyler, what kind of fan are you? Because if you're out there and, and you're so immersed in the detail of your own creation with Josh and it pays off so much for you and for us, then what are you like when you sit at home and listen to a song by 95% of the artists out there that aren't focused in that way? Not every artist is built with such a concept-driven mentality. So can you listen to that music and just be a fan of it? Or do you need more? I, I don't think this is a skill of mine. I think that we all have this in us. We have this ability to tell whether or not something took a long time. I think we can tell like that was something that they slaved over, that they probably tried 90 different times and they finally found the right one. Uh, of course, there's those songs that just roll, right? And that's like, you know, that's just tapping into, you know, the universe. And of course, there's those quick songs that are amazing. But what you know, the surrounding that song and the record and you know everything that goes with it and the live show, you can feel when something took a long time to create. And when I feel that in other people's music, that's when I get excited. That's when I realize whether or not it's it's my you know favorite song. You have to you have to respect the care that they put into that song and into those those shows and everything that comes with it what's your default kind of genre or album or artist when you're feeling upbeat what's the music you put on when you want to when you're like today's a good day i'm feeling great it's the piano man i love piano I, so i would i would go to ben folds and um billy joel every time good day that's the that's the dna of good day all day 
Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, and I'm not, I'm not ashamed to say it, whether it's, you know, Elton John himself or Billy Joel and, and Ben Folds for me. I mean, Ben Folds is like, I saw him in an airport once and I wasn't, I wasn't able to say hi. I was too scared. What is the sad music? How do you process when you're low? Yeah. And how does music help you? I listen to a lot of cigarettes. Oh, that'll do it. Yeah. That'll do it. There's actually a song uh by them that I anytime my daughter was like crying and wouldn't wouldn't, you know, shut up, I'd I'd play that on my phone and it was like that's when I realized that music truly is magical. It it's this specific song from Cigarettes. It's called like I think it's off the record like Valtar, you know, all those all those songs are different language. Valtar, I think it starts with a V. And when I played that song, she stopped right away and she listened. And you could tell that she was following along, even as a four-month-year-old kid. She was following along what that band had created. And that's like, man, that is... And when I told my, my wife this, who's, who's not very... She, she's not a very musical-minded person. She thought, no, there's no way that, this, that that worked. And then, you know... Now she's got it like on as a shortcut on her iPhone, like to hit that button and it loops that one song and she knows like it's powerful. So I want to talk about a song on this album, which I fell in love with immediately, which was Mulberry Street. And I love that song. It's one of my favorites on the album. Why? Why is it one of my favorites on the album? <laughs> yeah, Mulberry Street for me, it was uh, there is a street in New York City where Little Italy is. and the first time that I ever kind of like left Ohio, my manager at the time, we had some meetings with like record labels and stuff. And it was just a classic kid going to the big city moment. And he took, you know, he, he, he knew around, he'd lived in New York city for a few years in the past. And so he knew where he was going. So he took Josh and I, uh, and a couple of friends of mine that are, you know, are still kind of touring with us and creating with us and stuff. And, he took us to Little Italy and we had this, you know, it was just like, I've never felt more out of place in my life being in New York City, eating at some, you know, like, we're going to go get pizza. This isn't the pizza I'm used to, you know, just something that simple, kind of really reminding you that you're not, you're not at home anymore. And so this song to me was like very, I wanted to imagine that feeling again. There's so much more to the 21 Pilots experience than just listening to music. We danced around that a little bit more. People want to know about the title and in relation to the reverse and the way that it's, it's, it's well, within that title, of, there's a term Clancy is dead for the fans. Clancy is a character within this experience that relates to previous music and the whole concept of how that moves forward. Do you feel tied to it sometimes? Or I know you say it's your favorite thing in the world to do. But sometimes do you even sort of catch yourself with multiple writer's block where you're like, I'm having a hard enough time getting these songs out, let alone how am I going to how am I going to bring these characters and give them some kind of, you know, some resolution? Um, yeah, sometimes. But I call it the Matrix effect when when you build something that's so. In, in itself is so freeing. You can make a movie. And you can let the guy fly through the air and kick you in the face and land on his feet because you don't have to answer the question, how is that possible? Because they'd be like, he's in the Matrix. And so in a lot of ways, having built this world around all the songs, every idea I have, it's in that world. And it is the explanation for why I can make that song if I want. You would think that it would be restricting, but in fact, it's it's kind of the opposite, where it is it is the explanation for why I can do whatever I want. So why don't you just write a script, and why don't you make a movie, and why don't you write a, com write a comic book, and why don't you really throw yourself deep into that and create music and accompaniment as opposed to the accompaniment to the music? I might do that. You know, I think that... It's just slowly, as I, as I was work, writing music, you start to think this is your own little thing and it's probably, it's probably not going to stack up. That's, I remember thinking that a lot when I first started writing songs. Like, yeah, this is my song. I'm excited about it. I like what it's saying. I like how it sounds. But there, what are the chances it stacks up to what everyone else is doing? 
And then you get this burst of confidence and a little fearlessness and you just go. And what you realize is, oh, this does stack up. I'm slowly learning about that stuff and all kinds of things. That confidence that can, it's probably the number one most important thing that you can bring to the table in any creative collaborative environment. Obviously, you need to have a little self-awareness. You need to check yourself if you're, you know, overreaching. Um, but more times than not, it's it's a lot easier to trim back mm -hmm. than to try to glue on. And so when you're coming to the table with a with an idea, you know, don't be afraid of that. You know, like like lean into it. So when it comes to music video treatment and live show stuff and the ability to get on know, stage at the Grammys just... in your underwear. <laughs> yeah. All those things, you start to realize, hey, you know, as long as you just bring confidence to it, though, it'll it'll feel it'll feel right. Yeah, come on, Tyler. As someone who is a healthy amount of self-awareness as well as imagination, which is a beautiful combination, do you have moments when you're sitting down and you think about that moment and even you just go, oh, fuck, man, like maybe I jumped I the cannot shot. believe, I cannot believe we did that. I don't know what we were doing, but I'll tell you what. I've also had this this strategy. Anytime you get a picture taken for an ID or anything that's going to be, do something interesting. Oh, what's your passport do, like, photo then? Get, it's it's a little like they go straight on, sir, and you kind of cock it a little bit, and then <laughs> forever now you're like this. <laughs> so you just push it a little bit because it's just so worth it. Whenever you pull that passport, right, you can nudge your buddy and be like, "Remember when I did this?" <laughs> so I just I looked at I looked at accepting that Grammy award as just a moment. It's like. Hey, I could stand right there and take the ID straight forward, no sunglasses, no smiling, just or I could cock my head a little bit. Do you know what though? Smile a little bit and take my pants off. <laughs> Do you know what though? <laughs> the fucking courage, man, the risk you took. Because if you hadn't followed that album up with anything great, that would have been yeah. that would have been your footnote forever. It would have been the band that <laughs> they accepted the award in their underpants, right? In their underwear. Yep. Because everyone just would have forgotten about why you were on that stage. They just would have focused on what of what you were wearing on the stage. Thank God, man. Did you even realize after the fact, like, damn, stakes just got higher? <laughs> yeah, I did not. And I, I, actually, I honestly didn't realize that until just now when you said that. <laughs> facts, though. Um, facts. I actually, it's, no, you're right. Uh, I do think that the, the most amazing part of that story is that the confidence in the security in my friendship with Josh, that I would take my pants off first, I'd start walking, and I knew he was standing behind me with his pants off. There's a there's a long walk there where he could have just been like, I'm I'm good, you go ahead. And he would he could have just another moment where I realized, man, he He had you. He quite literally had my back. He had you. He had you. And he always has. It's a beautiful relationship. It's one that I really respect because you keep it to yourselves too. You keep the camaraderie in a, in a deliberate space. It's not like buddy buddy picture. It's a buddy film. You don't do that. It's it's like you value each other's privacy, but you also value the relationship and what it means to each other rather than to us. Yeah, I mean, we'll we'll we've had some moments, you know, just obviously like long hours on the phone or just hangs and just talk, like just recapping our whole career and every once in a while we'll stop and be like man i bet i bet some people would find this really interesting ah you know what this is just for us man this is just us you know you know continuing to build that chemistry and that trust well you said there for a second it didn't it didn't pass me by one day we'll tell the story it's a it's a hell of a story it's even more embellished because it's been so protected and surrounded by so much imagination so i guess once the story is told one more record one more mm -hmm. then what there'll be a there'll be a an explanation and a and a, and a bookend and then we can start talking about what is where does that want to live now you know we, we talked about you said like other outlets or something well i was going to say one more record in the current volume of no, of books or one more yes. record no i don't think one more record nothing i think one more record when it comes to the story that that i've been telling for all these records and then after that, I think then truly maybe moving on to 
another story or something. I was going to say, for freedom's sake, for freedom of thought and freedom of creativity and not to be beholden so much to this particular matrix? Yeah, because it wears on you. It's a, it, you know, as much as it's freeing to have a narrative to be writing, you know, under, you're still, you're still under something. You know, there's a weight there. No one wants to listen to or watch or read a story that doesn't end. Here's the thing, though, right? As we've, as we've had this conversation, it's become clear to me that the correlation that exists between your you as Tyler and the characters that you create that ultimately inhabit this, this, this world of 21 pilots, that they are moving in tandem. So as you continue to find this kind of letting go process and your child gets older and you start to think about what family means and who you are as a person, that you're gonna, you are, it's like you, this, this particular narrative, which served you so well during these awkward years is kind of coming to a natural conclusion, right? No, you're right. I know what, where I want to take this, but considering that the person that I am and the situations that I'm in in my life right now do absolutely bleed into this story there's still a part of it that's that you know must remain a mystery because I, I don't know where I'm gonna be yeah yeah I, I will say that I think that most every every record that I've finished when I'm done I'm done and I've got nothing left this is one where, and I don't know if it's because I've just been prepping myself to, I'm not going out on tour on this thing. I'm still down here. I'm like, I'm, I'm on to the next already. You're creating. I'm excited about it. You're creating already. Yeah. And, and so that's a, I guess, concerning in a sense that, you know, did I give everything I could have to the record or do I just needed to, I don't think I'm, I'm that concerned about it. In fact, I want to, I think that it's solely a positive that I am still just as excited about creating and writing songs as i was you know when i first started so I, I'm, I'm waiting for that to change at some point we'll see so what happens in and i'm speaking hopefully as well as hypothetically here uh in three months time when chris calls you up and says hey fellas you know dates on the books things are opening up we can get moving in 2022 how do you rationalize that in relation to this body of work versus what you're going to make next time? And do you know what I'm saying? Like, it's like interesting. Like everything I've done has been a live, a live representation of what that album means. And it's brought it to life and it's given everybody a deeper experience right now. In many respects, you're creating a cue for yourself. Yeah. I mean, to get right down to it, there's either we wait around and we play shows on this record that we're about to release. Or we make another record, and when we come out guns a-blazing, we're referencing this record and a new one. I, I don't know which direction we're going to go, but I'll tell you what, I'm, 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 not, I'm not putting the brakes on You're not right waiting now. around to find out. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm going to be ready for either. Are you any closer to, to identifying what you ultimately want to get out of this as a human being? What, what is true value is to you? You can TBD that if you want. I don't, I don't want to, but I do know that I'll probably have a different answer for it later than right now. Um, I think my focus right now, though, is I'm in such a season of my life about, about my kid. I want, I want to show her what hard work can do. I want to show her, I want her to understand the value of a dollar. I want her to also feel free. She can dream and be whatever she wants. I mean, truly, not, not the watered down, yeah, go do what you want, but truly believe that you can be. And, and so the idea of, like, I'm writing these records and I'm working on these, you know, shows and live stream event and all these things because I'm excited to show her. You know, it's a new, it's a new sense of purpose now. And not that it's the sole one, but it's the one that I'm focusing on a lot. What, what can I teach her? I really do think that, you know, I can already feel that me, I mean, we talk about timing, how I guess lucky that I was home the whole year that she was first born. I was able to really build a connection with her. And if we, you know, if the pandemic hadn't happened and the world didn't, you know, stop turning there for a while 
you know, and I've gone, gone out on tour, would I, would I have that connection that I have now? So I feel like I'm really fortunate that that happened and I want to capitalize on that because I feel like the foundation is there. She's already picked up on the ABCs and Twinkle Twinkle Little Star are the same melody. She knows that and she flip flops them when she sings them. And that's like, I'm like, try not to freak out about it. But I'm like, Jenna, she has pitch. She's got pitch. So I don't know. It's exciting. And it's, it's hard not to just answer that question through that lens right now. But like you mentioned, and like I mentioned, I think that ultimately that, that answer can change depending on the next time you ask it.